Let's open up with a word of prayer and we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for what you've done in our lives. Thank you for opening up our hearts to see and behold a Savior. Thank you for everything you do and how you take us through difficult times, struggles, and battles. And thank you that you are returning again. We just give you all the praise. Help us to be faithful to the very end, helping us to see what you can do in big ways through all of our lives. We just give you all the praise. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Well, um, 1 Corinthians 9.24, but I guess let me uh, read you this first. Psalms 9.20. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Um, I guess the reason I was thinking about changing up from Ephesians, we're about halfway through the year. Uh, A lot of us are halfway through our life. A lot of us are a lot more than past halfway through our life. Uh, You know, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) You like that halfway number. Well, if if you're pretty healthy and the Lord gives you grace, you've got about 27,000 days. And most of us have a lot, a lot fewer of those left, actually, Uh, except for the youngins. They probably have a lot more. But um, and, and it's not to focus in on the, the brevity of life. We're all pretty familiar with how short life is. But what this psalm is talking about is give us a heart of wisdom. In other words, with the time that we have here, let us, let us see this life from God's perspective and let, let us make sure that we glorify God in what we do with our lives and that we finish our race well. As Christians, as believers, as saints, we, we are involved in a race. And it, it's, it's a race or a competition in a sense that God gives to us and he wants us to finish that race very carefully. I'm sure we're all familiar with how the Christian life is like a race. So I started thinking about an important date. I don't know if anybody remembers this date. May 6, 1954. (laughs) All right, that's no excuse, you can study. Well, what was important about this date is over for about a thousand years, uh, no one thought what was going to be accomplished on this date was doable. In fact, they had tried and it had failed, and no one had ever been able to accomplish it or pull it off. But there was one man who had a dream, who had a vision, and he set out to run the mile in less than four minutes. And honestly, people just believed physically it was impossible. The human body could not go faster than 15 miles an hour to pull this off, because that's what it was going to take. But one man, Roger Bannister, I'm sure most of you are familiar with him, he ran it three minutes, 59 seconds, and four tenths. I mean, talk about cutting it down to, you know, six tenths of a second. That's, I mean, a blink of an eye and faster. But, so he had to run around that track four times to accomplish it, did that in Oxford, England. Uh, it was a rainy, kind of windy day, but it was it was timed. Uh, it, it was watched. Uh, there were spectators, and he he pulled it off. It was the and it's not to say that no one else had ever done it in human history, but it had never been verified. It had never been watched and timed, and and to be able to be authenticated so that it was provable. But um, he he won the prize to have the name as being the first man to ever accomplish a mile in less than four minutes. Of course, it only stood for about six weeks. And then uh, John Landry from Australia broke it. And then uh, finally, I think it's down to three minutes and 43 seconds from some guy from Morocco. That's where it holds now. But the point was is that no one had ever done it up to this point because they thought it was impossible. But he knew if he did the race right, he could win. But there's always more to the story than this. And this is what I want to focus on a little bit as we look at our lives involved in a race. Chris Chataway and Chris Brasher. Ever heard of those guys? Well, the reason Roger Bannister could win that time and break that record was because these two men, not only were they teammates, but they were pace setters. And this is what enabled him to pull it off. Basically, what that means is they ran alongside him so that Roger could measure his pace, his speed, his endurance, his progress. And with that, then he could set the record and win the prize. Without his two friends, he would have never been able to pull it off because he wouldn't have had anything to measure his progress by. So in the Christian life, we have two good measures that give us an indication, are we going to finish the race well? Will we finish it so that God is glorified? So what we're going to look at is the pace setters in the Christian life. <clears throat> but again, he, he would have never been able to accomplish it without having these two men. So they were running alongside off the track, but they were running a speed where he knew if I can maintain uh, a, a pace that keeps up with them because they they all planned this then I know I can break the four minutes if I can't keep that pace I won't do it so it was the pace setters that enabled him to win the prize 
Okay, so how is the Christian life like a race? What makes it like a race? There's a prize at the end. What else? It's very, very hard. There's a beginning and an end. Absolutely. It starts once you're saved. It's in once you take your last breath or the Lord returns at the Perusio. Okay, rapture. Uh, what else? Hmm? We're always running. Most of us are. Uh, it's, it's a long haul. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, um, it's, it's, it's not a short, short, short distance race. For, for some, it may be. I mean, the Lord may work in a person's life, save that person, and then moments later, they, it takes them home. I mean, there are people that have, you know, been converted and saved on their deathbed. Uh, but it seems like most people, uh, it's going to be a marathon to run the race. It's full of obstacles, potholes, unexpected surprises. Uh, Martha, most of the time it hurts. It doesn't feel good physically and emotionally. Uh, successful, you have to train. You've got to train. You've got to be consistent. You've got to be diligent. Uh, sometimes we get distracted, squirrel, you know, and all of a sudden just, uh, <laughs> you, you're just looking at something else and you should be focused in on the more important things. Uh, we lose sight of the goal. Um, and then there's also a crowd. There's always a crowd watching you. You may not think about that, but there's always a crowd watching you. The first century saints really had this, this mindset that we are in a race, a spiritual race, and that there are spectators. Um, our, our life is in view in a public arena. Look what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 9. He says, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have become a spectacle. And the word spectacle there is theatron. Uh, that's where we get our English word theater, but it's like a semicircle arena with spectators watching an event or watching the fight or watching the race. So we have become a spectacle uh, in the amphitheater, so to speak, to the whole universe, both to angels as well as men. So not only do people watch your actions, your decisions, your endurance, how well you're running the race, but the angelic kingdom as well watches it. We talked a little bit about that. <clears throat> and that, that's one thing God has designed. You say, well, why would the angels be interested in how I live my life? Because God has planned to show his wisdom, his glory, his power, his mercy through our lives to the rest of the angelic kingdom. His purpose was that now through the church, through me and you, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known, should be on display to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Uh, another verse in 1 Peter, we talked about this uh, last week, and now the gospel has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. And the Greek word there, it means that they are peering over the balcony. They're, they're intently, passionately, uh, as strong as you can come up with a strong word, they are interested in watching the gospel at work in your life and my life because they learn about their creator just as we learn about God through his working in our lives. They watch our lives and see God display his glory and his passion. At every race, someone will gain the victory, and unfortunately, some others will lose. But what's the one big difference in our Christian race versus any other competition or athletic event? What's, there's one big major difference. I guess there's a number of them, but one that I'm thinking of. Eternity. 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 It'll have a long-lasting, what would you say? Mulligans. Mulligans. <laughs> well, God is, God is a God of mulligans, I must admit. <laughs> he gives us much grace. <laughs> um, it, it's that... In normal competition, you're competing against competitors. But in the Christian life, there's no one that can take your prize. There's no one that can take your crown. There's no one that can steal um, what is available for you to win. The only way that can happen is if you lose it or you don't gain it to start with. But you're not competing against me, and I'm not competing against you. So there are no competitors except one, and that's you. Hmm? There can be multiple winners in this race. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, multiple. All of us can be winners in this race if you qualify for the competition and the prize. So your winning or losing is entirely up to you. And again, don't misunderstand me here. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about stewardship, and that's the biggest difference. Salvation is settled at the cross. Stewardship is what <clears throat> the, the New Testament puts the emphasis on for Christians. Paul says, so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. 
And to be faithful in our regards to our Christian life is to be faithful, to persevere, to be seeking God, and to be doing what he has for you to do to the very end. So our faithfulness, both in our relationship to Christ and our service to others, is really will determine our winning or losing the rewards God has for you. And again, we've done the whole study on the crowns of the Christian life. We've gone through each crown, what you have to do to qualify for it, uh, what you have to do to not be qualified for it. Um, we've, we've examined those in, in quite a lot of detail, so I wasn't going to take the time today to go over the crowns that are available. <clears throat> but those are crowns, those are rewards uh, for faithful service. And certain crowns are available to everyone. Certain crowns are only available to certain people. So God has set it up very much on a motivational uh, compensation or a motivational reward type of system. Uh, Jesus says to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3, I'm coming soon, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Now at first glance it's like, well I thought you said no one can take your crown. Well, it's not that someone else is stealing your crown, but it's that you're losing your crown because through compromise or laxness. So if you don't finish strong, you will not win the prize. In the first century, the concept was someone could take your crown. So this is being compared to that, but really, I can't grab your crown or you can't take my reward. It's a matter of whether or not we will faithfully hold on to what we have accomplished. So we must diligently forsake and cast off those things that weigh or slow us down. Hebrews 12.1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and remember, what, what came before Hebrews 12? Hebrews 11. Thank you. Okay, that wasn't a, that wasn't a trick question. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. I know there's a trick. Um, yeah, Hebrews 11. And what was in Hebrews 11? The faith. <clears throat> the faith chapter. All of those individuals who, through their life, their endurance, their patience, their, their faithfulness and their stewardship, accomplished things that honored God and gained them the reward. So then the writer, I think Paul wrote Hebrews, but then, then he goes on to say, now because of all of these witnesses that have gone on before you, and the word witness there is martos, which we get our word martyr from. So of all of these martyrs or all of these witness testimonies before you, because of how they've lived and they are in heaven, now live your life faithfully so that you can accomplish the same type of quality that they have won for them. So let us throw off every weight and sin. The weight there is agnos. It means a burden. Um, it's a, a bulk that becomes a, a, an encumbrance. Um, I mean, it'd be like trying to r r run a race with, uh, you know, air tanks on your back or, or a backpack full of rocks. I mean, it, it is not going to be conducive to being faithful to accomplish that. So two things that will slow us down in our race with, with Christ. And again, it's not a race to beat anybody out. It's a race to see how you will do in regards to stewardship. God saves us so that, first of all, we can draw closer to him. He doesn't need more servants. He's got all the servants he needs. The angels is plenty enough servants. But he saves us so that we can first have a, a intimacy with him. Um, John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. The word know is gnosko. It means an active relationship between the one knowing and the one to be known. There is an intimacy that's taking place. That's the first reason um, God has saved you, to know him, to experience him, to, to, to learn to love him more by who he is. Then from there, from our love of him, we want to serve, we want to give, we want to minister to others. So the two things that will slow us down is the first one is weight. It's hard to run faithfully when you're tangled up with weight, when you're distracted or hampered with extra bulk. Paul says, 1 Timothy 4, 8, For exercise of the body profits a little for this time, but righteousness profits in everything, and it has the promise of for both the present life and the life to come. What Paul is saying here is that there are things that, it, that are not sin, uh, take exercise, for, for instance. Exercise can be beneficial. It can be helpful. It can help you maintain uh, uh, the, the use of your body because it's hard to serve if you don't have a body that's functioning well. So he says, that's good and proper, but just remember, keep that in perspective. You, if all of a sudden your goal is to be the best looking body or the most healthiest body and your whole life becomes focused on being healthy or, or strong or fit, 
it, all of a sudden that has become a weight to you. In other words, that's not what God wants. He wants us to maintain health for our bodies, obviously, but he wants us to make sure that what we're focusing in on is, is something that is honestly going to last for eternity, glorify God, and draw us closer to the Lord. And so we have to be careful of the things that we get involved in, hobbies, activities, uh, events. Are, are, are they really things that are going to motivate you and help you in your walk with Christ? Now, that doesn't mean you can't have hobbies and do all those kind of things. I, I always try to have as many hobbies and just effort, activities, uh, especially when you're single. I think it's helpful to have as many hobbies and activities to make yourself look interesting to the, another person. I mean, nobody wants to marry a boring person. So the, 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 more, the more qualified you are, I mean, all of that's good. But are these things, though, that are going to make us completely focused in this race and so he says now one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the affairs of this life so that he may please his recruiter or his captain and again satan is very adept if he can't keep you from being saved and he can't because god's power overrules then he begins to work on getting you distracted distracted with work distracted with family distracted with money distracted with career distracted with your body distracted i mean the list goes on and on and you're saying well those are bad things are they no of course not we have to take care of all of those things but it's the question of do those things become a passion because as soon as it becomes a passion it's going to consume more of your energy we need to be wise and cautious with what attracts our heart because as the heart goes so go the thoughts the passions and the time and the one thing everybody wishes they could have more of but you can't get it is more time so we've got to be very careful with where we invest our time um, you know it, it, training you know for your for your job that's great you know have the training if the Lord leads you to, to, to move in an area to become a better adept so that you have a greater ministry or service or work that's fine but it's those other areas that mm, do you really want to spend that much time and energy into an area that is not going to have an eternal benefit for others? So, and again, it's not, it's not anything someone can point at you and say or point at me and say. It's something you just have to take before the Lord and let them. Because you don't want it to become a weight. You don't want it to be a distraction. You don't want to become encumbered by something like that. Questions, comments? Just that we should be bearing fruit in all of this. John 15. <clears throat> Yeah. Good point. It's, it's what we're doing, bearing fruit to God. Is, is it honoring to God? Because remember, you're, you're not your own. I mean, slaves don't have much input into their life. <laughs> and we are bond slaves to Christ. Um, we have been saved to follow and obey and honor him. So it's not a question of God's holding me back or it's not anything like that at all. It's that God has designed you and made you to experience him. And from that experience, from that relationship, God is going to do great things in and through your life. Thanks for bringing that up. I was just sitting here thinking about not just runners, but most people that are <coughs> wanting to uh, make their bodies better. They use weights to build up muscle and strength and endurance. But in the race, they don't use those weights because it does slow them down. Yeah. Anyone else? That's weight. Not sin, but that's weight, and it can be an encumbrance or a distraction to you. The next area that'll, that can be an entanglement for us can not only slow us down, but it can actually disqualify us from the reward. Again, now we're not talking about salvation here, but we're disqualifying you from your crown, from your reward, and that's sin. It is hard to endure uh, if you're disobeying. It is hard to bring glory to God. It is hard to be a good steward if you are willfully, knowingly um, disobeying uh, or ignoring God's commands or forgetting God's commands. That's why we constantly, you know, come back together on a weekly basis to be reminded of God's word, to be encouraged, to be motivated, uh, to be encouraged. So there are three areas of sin that the Christian have to be extremely guarded against. Hebrews 12, 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. So here's three areas that we have to be careful we don't slip up in or that we don't fall into because these will, if left unchecked, if left unrepented of, these three areas will 
completely disqualify you from any rewards. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up to cause trouble and defile many. I think the writer of this verse was thinking about the Deuteronomy 29 verse where it talks about a, a, a bitter heart towards God and it really is a bitter heart towards God thinking that he hasn't given you what, what you think you should be given. And so it's, it, the bitterness is really a strange thing because it all of a sudden goes down to a resentment. You, you think God should have done this for you or opened up this door for you or brought this person into your life. Whatever area that the enemy can come in and start to cause resentment in your life, that's something we have to be so, so cautious of. And the way to guard against it is that God is good and God is holy, and God is, his loves me to the very end. How do I know that? Because he gave the most valuable thing that he could ever give to redeem us. So when our focus is on Christ, the root of bitterness dies very, very quickly. Second area, see to it that no one is sexually immoral. Well, everyone is going to struggle, fall, and stumble because we have bodies of, of flesh. I mean, with feet of clay and hearts of heaven. But we, we live in a society today that everything is so geared towards sexuality. And unless you are maintaining that walk, it gets very, very difficult to, to stay firm in that. Uh, the Greek word there, that it's one word is pornea, and we know what word we get from pornea. Um, and so, so th this is an area where where the writer is saying you have to maintain holiness because without holiness, God is not going to use unholy vessels. Now, does that mean if I slip or fall or stumble um, that that's it? Heck no. <laughs> I mean, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said, hey, if the brother has sinned, if the sister has sinned, restore them. I mean, God's grace can handle any mistake I've made. And I've made mistakes, but God has been merciful through repentance and through humility to bring back. In fact, usually what God does, as we, even in our study of David, you know, we saw David make some huge mistakes. Now, did he suffer consequences from those mistakes? Well, sure. I mean, obviously anyone was not going to deny that. But yet his final tally was that he was a man after God's heart. Well, how could he be a man after God's heart when he fell and fell and, or disobeyed? It's that is what grace is all about. It's not about how much I sin. It's how much God's grace can restore the sinner. And the last area, see to it that no one is godless like Esau, who sold his birthright for a meal of porridge. What really the focus here is, for a Christian, we live in a dual world. We live in a physical world that we can see, but we also live in an unseen world that has more impact really upon our lives. So it's the difference between an eternal value system or a temporal value system. What did Esau see? All he saw was that I'm hungry, I have a desire, there's a, a, a pile of food here in front of me, I'll give whatever you want for that pile of food. Well, what did he give up for that pile of food? I mean, he gave up everything that God had intended for the firstborn to have. The double portion of inheritance, as well as the name, as well as the blessing. And so he gave up all of that for a temporal pleasure. I mean, how many times have you blown it or sinned in some area or whatever area, and yet you look back and say, that really wasn't worth it. When you start to look at the consequences, it's like, that makes no sense whatsoever. So this, for Christians, this is a tough battle because we live in such a world that is designed for pleasure here and now, you know, go for it all. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. It's like, well, that doesn't even make sense. But that's what we're programmed to think, but we gotta go to scriptures constantly to get programmed for eternal value systems. And that's what Esau was. He, he, was, he was a temporal value system uh, person versus an eternal value system. So we need to guard against the worthless distractions that weigh us down and avoid the bitterness, moral impurity, and the worldly value system. If, if you can accomplish those three areas uh, perfectly, no, but if you can maintain a, a, a straight line in those areas, you'll be amazed at how God will use you in people's lives. Because again, the question is, God, I want you to use me. And one of the biggest qualifications for usability is holiness, is dedication to God. And so when Paul talks in 2 Timothy 2 about vessels fit for honor, he wants those vessels that, that are most like Christ. The more Christ-like you are, the more usable you are. So. How well are we running our race? 
Okay, Roger Bannister had two important pace setters that measured his race. We'll wrap it up with this. Here's the two pace setters, and I'm sure you could come up with three or four. And maybe I should have been three pace setters because that would have made more sense in the church, but two is what I came up with, so that's what we got. Do, not, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Okay, that we've covered. Run your race in such a way as you can capture the prize. And the word capture there is catalambano, and it means to, not, doesn't mean to just walk up and receive your prize. It means to take it down vigorously. It means to seize it and make it your own. It means to grasp it forcefully. So Paul is n not saying uh, just, just in a mild manner way. He's saying make this your goal, make it passionate for your soul, and for forcefully, firmly grab this reward. Don't lose this reward. Make sure that you can capture the prize. So the two pace setters that I came up with and I thought about the Christian life, number one, and this is not complicated stuff. In fact, the more, the more simpler I keep my understanding, the better I seem to do. How much time are you spending in God's word? I mean, it's not a complicated metrics by any means. How much time are you spending in God's word? When your words came, Jeremiah said, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. I mean, it seems, especially over the last two years with how confusing the world has been and just all the craziness and all the, the disconnected schedules, it seems like the enemy wants to slowly move you away from spending quality time in the Word. Now, I don't know, your quality time may be five minutes or five hours. I, I'm not trying to put a clock on my life, but I'm trying to put a metric, a pace setter that can give me some idea. If I'm not even opening my Bible, then I'm probably going to be slowly drifting off in one of those three areas. And I want to be very, very careful because I want to win my race well for Christ. A heart of obedience to God comes from spending time in the Word, and definitely a heart of intimacy with Christ comes from spending the time in the Word. It's amazing how the Spirit of God just opens up Scripture, or will start to connect portions of Scripture for you, and start putting the thoughts and the truths together, and just start giving you new insight about God Himself, which delights the heart more than anything else. Questions on that? Testimonies? Confessions? No. <laughs> That's a good point. That's an excellent point. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. How many times have you had good time in the Word, and then something will happen that the Word God ministered to your heart is exactly what you needed, either to guard yourself, to protect yourself, or more often than not, to minister to someone else. It, it, it amazes me how often God does that. And yet, if I'm not spending time, I don't have anything to seemingly give to that person, or I'm weak and susceptible to a temptation. And so that's an excellent point, Roger. Thank you for bringing that up. And like what Diddy said, or I feel what she said, it's like when you read the Word, it's like that was not in there the last time. I think somebody's been messing with my Bible. I always realize it's Right. Excellent. I mean, I'm sure we could all attest to that. Why? Well, I, I never saw that before. Really? I never saw that before. Yeah. I looked at, I have two Bibles. I sit down. I, <clears throat> this is one, and now I have a big study Bible. And I'm looking at this Bible, and I'm looking at this Bible, going, wait a minute, I didn't underline that this time when I read it, you know, and I underlined because it means something <clears throat> that's totally different than it meant. I wonder if we get to take our Bibles with us because there's so much 
<laughs> notes and scribbles and dates and. I'm hoping we have them memorized by the time. <laughs> or at least we don't need them anymore. Exactly. Didn't God say He's going to write His word on our hearts? Yes. Yeah, He did. Yeah. There you go. Guess that's all that. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Michael. There, to me, too, uh, as we read God's word, sometimes God puts a particular promise or a particular challenge in Scripture that we are then given that opportunity in real life to mm -hmm. test out. Yes. And had we not spent the time in God's word, it wouldn't have even been on our radar, but, but that testing yeah. out in real life <clears throat> To me, that that feels so much of the uh, getting to know Christ. Yes. Yeah, because we know about Christ. I, I'm I'm over exaggerating, but it's almost like we know about Christ mm -hmm. when we read God's word, but we know Christ mm -hmm. as we put His word into. Sure. Practice. No, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> well, if the first metric is how much time we're spending in God's word, and you can phrase it however you want, the second one is how much time are we serving in the area of our spiritual gift. And I know I go on and on about spiritual gifts because it's the area you're going to have to give an account for when you stand before Christ. For we must all appear before the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may re be rewarded for the accomplishments done in the body, whether good or bad. It's like you mean you get rewards for bad? No, no, you lose rewards for the bad. Not bad sin. Again, this is not a, 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 an examination of sin. It's an examination of stewardship, stewardship, stewardship. What did you do with the giftings God gave you? And we've, we've gone over the whole spiritual gift study, and we need to do it again. But God has given each, the Holy Spirit has given each believer giftings, spiritual giftings for the edification of the body and he wants you to develop those gifts not only so you can learn more about God and his abilities to work through broken vessels but also so that you can edify and build up others with the giftings God's given you and when we are serving and helping others with the giftings God has entrusted us. I mean, it is so critical because when we stand before Christ, after the rapture, after the parousia, we stand before Christ, your name's called up. I believe the questions are gonna be on, what did you do with the giftings I gave you? I mean, he's not gonna ask me, how did you do in administrating First Baptist Church? I have nothing to do with administrating First Baptist Church. But he's gonna ask me, what did you do with the gift of teaching? What did you do with the gift of encouragement? What did you do? Well, those are the gifts that I'm accountable for. I'm not accountable for your gifts. You're not accountable for my gifts, but I'm accountable for my gifts. And if I don't exercise them well, if I haven't utilized them or developed them, I'm afraid we're going to lose rewards and that will definitely be a regret. So with these two pace setters, how's your progress in your race? And at your current rate, will you break the mile? Will you obtain the prize and be victorious? And again, that's not to be a downer. That's just to say, Lord, there's areas I can, I can tighten up. Um, I can train a little harder. I can be a little bit more disciplined. I can cut out a few excess baggage and weight that I've gotten myself into, and I want to be focused more on the time I have left because I can't get any more time. So next week, we'll get back to Ephesians, finish up our power prayer number four. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know his incomparable great power for us who believe. I need God's power in my life and I want to understand how that works. Questions, comments? <laughs> no, I'm afraid I won't either. <laughs> I'm afraid I won't either. Well, Father, thank you for your word that challenges us, that, that, that reminds us that we are in a serious race for your glory. You gave everything for us. Might we give everything we possibly can for your glory. We give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen.